Audrey Hepburn. With her charm and elegance, she was the definition of perfection in Hollywood and around the world. Long before Sex and the City, Audrey Hepburn portrayed the epitome of the New York single woman in the film Breakfast at Tiffany's. The film remains one of the most popular romantic movies ever made thanks to her memorable performance. Audrey Hepburn never understood how she became a movie star. She once said, my career is a complete mystery to me. It's been a total surprise since the first day. How do I look? Very good. From international superstar to world-class humanitarian, Audrey Hepburn became a symbol of style and class, gracing everything she touched. She sure was a hell of a good actress. She sure knew what the hell she was doing. And uh, she sure was something special. A veteran of only 27 films, she is one of the most recognized and best loved women in the world. She was love and humor and grace and open and knowing and perfect. She was perfect. And I had the opportunity to see how deep her soul is and its commitment to life. And the love that the woman exudes is just absolutely fathomless. Audrey Hepburn was born in Brussels, Belgium on May 4th, 1929. The name on her birth certificate read Audrey Kathleen Rustin, although most people knew her by her baptismal name, Edda van Heemstra Hepburn Rustin. Her mother, the Baroness Ella van Heemstra, was already a divorcee and raising two sons when she met and married Audrey's father, Joseph Hepburn Rustin, an Anglo-Irish businessman with a penchant for easy living. Her father was a banker of some sort. Eh, he was more like a wheeler dealer. But her mother was a member of the Dutch aristocracy. So financially, they were uh, certainly better off than uh, most people. Not all of the nobility by any means were wealthy, but uh, they did have several residences. But they fought constantly about a lot of things, uh, money in particular. To avoid her parents' incessant arguing, Audrey spent most of her time with nannies or with her half-brothers, Ian and Alexander. Her, her childhood was not lonely because she had her two brothers whom she adored and she was a, a tomboy. By 1934, Audrey's father became enamored of conservative pro-German propaganda. And although the Baroness tolerated her husband's politics, she felt her daughter would be better off away from home. At the tender age of five, young Audrey was packed up and sent to a fashionable boarding school. From a very early age, she was always rather shy and withdrawn and introspective, and it had gotten to the point where her mother was worried about her. So her mother sent her to a boarding school in England uh, as shock therapy. That, those were Audrey's words of description and uh, it evidently worked. Audrey blossomed at her new school. Here she learned English and showed a talent for dance. But tensions at home were growing and by 1938 the Baroness and Joseph divorced. From that time on Audrey would rarely see her father. Her father left the family, uh, abandoned them completely. This was one of the worst events of her life and one of the most uh, defining moments of her life in a very negative way. It always left her with an insecurity, which she herself spoke of frequently. In 1939, as the war in Europe escalated, the Baroness insisted on rejoin her in Arnhem, Holland, where she and her sons had relocated. But no country in Europe was safe from Hitler's tyranny. On May 5th, 1940, Nazi troops rolled through the streets of Arnhem, heralding the ominous onset of occupation. One brother went into hiding uh, just before he was uh, forcibly uh, inducted into German service, and her other brother was inducted and taken to a forced labor situation in Germany. 
Hartree's mother uh, during the war years uh, was quite incredible, first of all because of the amount of work that she did, but also in the way that she looked after Hartree. She made certain that uh, she availed herself of whatever food there was to, to, to feed Hartree, even managed to get her some um, uh, ballet lessons. Faced with deprivation and the growing horrors of war, Audrey threw herself more and more into the glamorous and rigorous world of dance. Before long, she was allowed to study and perform at the Arnhem Conservatory of Music. They did have what they called blackout performances, which were wonderful. Uh, they would be performed in someone's basement privately to raise a little money for the resistance. And, um, you weren't allowed to applaud at the end because it would have alerted the Germans. And Audrey once said that uh, her favorite audiences in the world in her life were the ones who never made a sound when she finished a performance. As Holland suffered under the scourge of Nazi occupation, Audrey did what she could to help the Allied resistance whenever possible. Audrey was involved a little bit, which would have been that she took messages occasionally to people. Uh, the kids could keep them in their shoes. They could... Uh, have a lot more mobility than the adults. On September 17th, 1944, the Allied powers attempted to liberate Holland and swooped down on Arnhem in Operation Market Garden. Audrey and her mother now found themselves in the midst of the biggest combined air land offensive of the war. The Battle of Arnhem it's even more astounding. This is a tiny backwater little town, and in 1944, it turned into the site of the single greatest Allied disaster of the entire war. And Audrey not only lived there, but watched it. The Van Heemstra home was bombed to the ground, and the Nazis forced the entire city to retreat. Food, always in short supply, now became impossible to find. The Dutch grimly referred to the time as their hunger winter. Life was extremely difficult for them under those circumstances. No food at all. They were reduced to eating tulip bulbs and cooked grass. For Audrey, adolescence had been overshadowed by the struggle for survival. Finally, on the day after her 16th birthday, she was granted the greatest gift she could imagine. On May 5th, 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allied forces. The war was at last over. Within days, food and emergency supplies began pouring in from the United Nations Relief Fund, known as UNRWA, the forerunner of UNICEF. Within weeks, Audrey's brothers returned home, and her family and the world joined together in a long overdue reunion. After the war, Arnhem was completely devastated, in ruins. Uh, there was no future for them there. They had to leave. In 1948, Audrey and her mother relocated to bustling post-war London, where Audrey was to study on a ballet scholarship. Dropping her Dutch surnames, Audrey Edda van Heemstra Hepburn Rusten would be known simply as Audrey Hepburn. But at 19 years old, the struggling five foot seven dance student was devastated to learn that she was by now too tall and too old to ever be a prima ballerina. Ballet is what gave her discipline. Um, of course, when she went to England, it wasn't just dedication to the ballet and to work. There was the, the need to work in order to, to sustain herself. Both she and her mother worked at, at whatever jobs they could find. Utilizing her dance training, Audrey settled for work as a chorus girl and quickly found employment in several West End shows and nightclubs. She became a favorite at Ciro's, not so much for her dancing, but for her infectious spirit. What people seemed to like about her the most was the eyes. The eyes always got everybody. But also she had an openness and a, um, an ease about herself that people found not just lovely to look at, but charming as a character trait. While working at Ciro's, Audrey caught the attention of casting directors and fashion photographers alike, eventually gaining her bit parts in British films like The Secret People and The Lavender Hill Mob. She saw it as pure luck, of course, that she could not understand why people wanted 
for her to be in the films and what they thought was so special about her, so she made up for it by working extra hard. In 1951, stardom was the last thing on Audrey's mind when she was invited to France for a leading role in a charming but otherwise forgettable film called Monte Carlo Baby. But I'm only a baby. Baby? Bullock, I refuse to utter such miserable drivel. What? You know what you can do with your precious picture. Hmm? Bury it in a lonely place. Melissa, Melissa. While there on the set, Colette, the great French writer who had just written a play, spotted Audrey just standing in the background waiting for a scene to be shot and said, voila, there's my Gigi. Gigi was scheduled to open in New York and the part of Colette's young French courtesan demanded a unique blend of innocence and sex appeal, an abundance of which Colette felt Audrey embodied. The inexperienced actress, however, was not so sure. At the age of 22, Audrey Hepburn boarded the Queen Mary bound for America. The former dancer who had overcome the perils of World War II was about to launch a full-scale assault on Broadway. Third, 1951, New York City was ripe with excitement. Death of a Salesman was a hit on Broadway. The New York Giants were about to win the pennant race. And an unknown actress was about to debut in a French comedy at the Fulton Theater. She hadn't had an acting lesson. Uh, now she was supposed to take the lead in a major Broadway play. She had a quote that she made to the newspapers, which was, now all I have to do is learn how to act. After six weeks of rigorous rehearsals, Gigi opened on schedule and to rapturous reviews. Audrey Hepburn's debut became the talk of the town and Hollywood began to take notice. Now wander down here without your hands in your pockets and settle down in that chair and we'll make a nice close up of you. Share it to the Tell us about the war. You spent the whole war in Arnhem. Yes. Wasn't it pretty awful? Yes, it was very bad. But did you entertain the people there yourself? Is that how you began? No, not, not quite how I began. I went to ballet school once I knew I was settled there for quite a while. Didn't know how long the war was going to last, so I went to a ballet school and learned to dance. And in about 1944, about a year before the end of the war, I was quite capable of performing. And it was a sort of some way in which I could make some contribution and I did give performances to collect money for the underground which always needed money. And what about the Germans? What did they do about it? There's no about it. Hepburn's unique combination of coltish beauty and regal charm appealed to veteran film director William Wyler and he cast the young actress in the role of a lifetime as the runaway princess opposite Gregory Peck in Roman Holiday. Ecco qua, finito. It's perfect. Oh. Uh, you'd be nice without long hair. Now it's cool. Hmm? Yes. Cool? It's, it's just what I wanted. <laughs> I've heard of a wonderful place for dancing on a boat. Oh, you mean the barges down by San Angelo? Yes, couldn't we go over tonight? Hey, why not? Well, anything you wish. And then at midnight I'll turn into a pumpkin and drive away my glass slipper. <laughs> and that'll be the end of the fairy tale. Both the film, Roman Holiday, and the relationship with Gregory Peck were in the fairy tale league. Uh, he was, and still is, uh, one of the most wonderful gentlemen uh, in the entire business. He made sure that she got the top billing, helped her throughout the whole process. They fell in love with each other in a very platonic way. When you see Roman Holiday, you get the overwhelming perfume of this creature, this extraordinary, original, elegant, beautiful, gentle creature that just radiates from the screen. Which of the cities visited did your highness enjoy the most? It would be difficult to... Rome. By all means, Rome. 
I will cherish my visit here in memory as long as I live. Capitalizing on their new star's success, Paramount immediately cast Audrey in Sabrina. Billy Wilder's May-December romance, co-starring Humphrey Bogart and William Holden. Oh, it's you, Sabrina. Hello, David. I thought I heard somebody. No, it's nobody. As the chauffeur's daughter turned chic, European sophisticate, Audrey was assisted in her screen transformation by a talented young fashion designer named Hubert de Givenchy. Hubert de Givenchy tells a very funny story about people call him and say Miss Hepburn is coming to see you to close in her next film and at the time she wasn't world renowned so he expected Catherine Hepburn to show up at the door and knock knock he opens the door and there's this lovely young little thing he has no idea who she is and of course they hit it off famously a friendship and a partnership that lasted 40 years. This is maddening. I know I've seen that face before. Let me see your profile again. I know, I know you. I have a feeling I've seen you with your father. Wait a minute, is your father Admiral Starrett? Hardly. Chief among Audrey's growing list of admirers was leading man William Holden. Sabrina, Sabrina, where have you been all my life? Right over the garage. While their on-screen chemistry sizzled, their real-life romance stalled when the 34-year-old actor informed his leading lady that he could no longer have children. Hepburn wanted Holden, but she wanted marriage and a family even more. But as Hollywood greeted its new discovery with open arms, it was shocked when the actress headed back to Broadway. She had agreed to star in Undine, a French play directed by and co-starring Mel Ferrer. Twelve years her senior and twice divorced, Ferrer was full of passion for his craft. He instilled in Audrey the belief that acting could be as important and rewarding a means of expression as her beloved ballet. Undine is a very beautiful love story in which Mel Ferrer and I appear together. Mel plays the knight errant and I play a water sprite. On February 18th, 1954, Undine opened to mixed reviews. And despite the fact that Audrey's notices were decidedly more favorable than Ferrer's, the two were blissfully in love. But in sharp contrast to Undine's cool reception by New York was the heat Hepburn was generating in Hollywood. Nominated for her performance in Roman Holiday, she surprised the industry and herself when she was awarded Oscar as the year's best actress. It's too much. I, I want to say thank you to everybody who in these past months and years have helped, guided, and given me so much. I'm truly, truly grateful and terribly happy. But no one was more surprised than Audrey when just three days later she received the 1954 Tony Award for her performance in Undine. Within a few months, Hepburn had gone from an unknown to a megastar, and it seemed everyone was falling in love with her. But the pressures of overnight success were beginning to take their toll. Bombarded by reporters and robbed of any privacy, the shy, insecure actress took time off and went to Switzerland. Shortly afterward, on September 25, 1954, in a small private service, Audrey Hepburn and Mel Ferrer became husband and wife. Among her private vows was one never to let celebrity and the demands of a career interrupt her personal life. Within months, the 25-year-old bride was thrilled to learn she was pregnant. But Hepburn's joy turned to despair when she suffered a miscarriage. Hoping to ease his wife's depression, Ferrer encouraged her to go back to work and arranged a co-star with her in an epic screen version of War and Peace. This unparalleled motion picture encompasses all the novel's tremendous scope with these great stars. Audrey Hepburn reaching the pinnacle of her career as Natasha. Mel Ferrer scoring a triumph of artistry as Andrea. History's most awesome panorama in the motion picture of a century.
But though popular with critics, War and Peace fared only modestly at the box office. Better was Funny Face, another fairy tale confection about a bookworm turned fashion model, co-starring Fred Astaire. Once again costumed by Givenchy, the film offered Audrey the chance to utilize her training as a dancer. She knew, well, here's an area, if I just work hard, I know I can make this work. And it shows, you can tell the kind of métier that there is behind every move. Funny Face was a runaway success, and Audrey followed it with a similarly themed Love in the Afternoon, co-starring Gary Cooper. But by now, Audrey, encouraged by her husband, wanted to break away from the kinds of formulaic stories that Hollywood kept preparing for her. She wanted the chance to prove herself a serious actress. We're here in Manhattan. I'm David Folk Thomas, and this is Street Bio. When you think Audrey Hepburn, what do you think of? Elegance, refinement, intelligence, and just so it's such an exciting actress. Exactly. All of those things true. I'm going to give you a little tidbit about her. Did you know that she helped the resistance during World War II in Holland? Had no idea. She actually smuggled secret messages, and she carried them in a certain way. Do you know which way that was? I don't think it'd be in her decotage. <laughs> Probably her breath. Why does everybody keep saying that? In her shoe. Wow. You know what? Ballet shoes. In her <laughs> ballet shoes. But I'm going to give you full credit. How did you know that? Because <laughs> that's where I would have carried it. <laughs> Mr. Have you considered the seriousness of what you're doing? Yes. Sister, is there nothing we can do? Nothing. Released in 1959, the nun story showed Hepburn in a totally new light. Gone were the stylish Givenchy gowns and chic locations. Instead, the actress had to depend exclusively on her talent and convey intense internal conflict. I think we all have a special place for the nun story. Put her in the category of extremely serious actresses. She's beautiful, she's emotional. Now she's really in charge of what's happening. The Nun Story received an impressive eight Oscar nominations, including Audrey's third for Best Actress. Now confident and able to choose even more ambitious film projects, Audrey agreed to star in Green Mansions, directed by Ferrer, and The Unforgiven, a western directed by John Huston. But while making The Unforgiven, Audrey suffered yet another miscarriage and sank into a deep depression. She was tremendously devastated by a series of miscarriages. She wanted to have children more than anything, more than a career, even. Happily, Audrey soon became pregnant again, and this time she took no risks. Remaining bedridden in Switzerland and turning down all film offers, her lifelong dream came true when she gave birth to a son, Sean Ferrer on January 17th, 1960. She very much wanted to have children. She loved children. I think it may have been a way to heal her own youth, but I think she wanted that friendship, which she got. We were great friends. I think that Audrey wanted to be a mother, to have her own children more than anything else. Until she had her children, she, in my mind, didn't consider her, herself whole. Having reached the defining point in her personal life, Audrey followed motherhood with the defining role of her career. Won't you join me? Yes, join Audrey Hepburn as you've never seen her before, kicking over the traces and bringing to life Truman Capote's breakfast at Tiffany's. You have a special invitation to attend Audrey Hepburn's open house on the wildest night New York ever knew. As Holly Golightly, Truman Capote's world-weary call girl in Breakfast at Tiffany's, Audrey had once and for all proved her versatility as an actress and her box office clout as a star. It's essentially a very offbeat story and very unlike her previous 
roles and character uh, and uh, very much worried a lot of uh, people around her as to whether or not the public would accept such a thing. Well, I never got the impression that she was particularly nervous about it. There was a, a very strong core to Audrey in spite of uh, certain obvious insecurities. Co-starring George Pippard, one of the few times she was given a love interest her own age, the film tapped Audrey's smoldering sexuality and heartbreaking charm. Two drifters off to see the world. Oh God, I fell in love with her. After the San Francisco preview, the head of the studio, who had recently become the head of the studio, made his one and only great pronouncement and said, well, I'll tell you one thing. We're going to get rid of that song. Fortunately, Audrey was there. And she said over my dead body. Mancini's Moon River won the 1961 Oscar for Best Original Song, and Audrey received her fourth nomination as the year's Best Actress. It now seemed apparent to everyone that Audrey Hepburn could do no wrong. She continued to surround herself with top directors, top writers, and top co-stars, as when she appeared with Shirley MacLaine in the highly praised and highly controversial The Children's Hour. Just when we're getting on our feet, you're ready to let it all go to hell. Arthur, for God's sake, do you expect me to give up my marriage? But after completing Paris When It Sizzles, opposite William Holden, and Charade, co-starring Cary Grant, Hepburn once again felt the need to return to the simple pleasures of home and family. She loved us being home with her family. We'd have dinner in the kitchen, and she loved sour apples for dessert. She certainly respected and loved her career, but her family really came first. For well, now, Hepburn was content to focus her energies on family rather than films. And it would take a remarkable Cockney flower girl to convince her to change her mind. I want to be a lady in a flower shop, instead of sitting at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. But they won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. He said he could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to pay him, not asking any favor, and he treats me as if I was dirt. Eliza in My Fair Lady was the role that all actresses were dying to play. Hepburn got it over Julie Andrews, who played the role on Broadway and had uh, never made a picture, and whom Jack Warner was not about to cast in a zillion dollar film uh, that was gonna be the biggest, most expensive musical in Hollywood history. Come on, come on Dover, come on Dover. Based on Lerner and Lowe's hugely popular Broadway musical, the Rags to Riches tale seemed perfect for Audrey Hepburn's unique screen talents. Perfect in every way but one. Hampered by her lack of a singing voice and by the popular preference for Julie Andrews, Audrey was determined to meet the challenges of the role. But although she hired a singing coach and pre-recorded the demanding vocals, studio executives made the humiliating decision to replace Audrey's singing voice with that of professional voice double, Marnie Nixon. Audrey was deliberately misled into believing that she was going to sing, if not every note, most of it. Seen and heard here is a rare version of one of the film's classic musical numbers, this time with Audrey's original vocal track. Where you bound for this year, Eliza Beerits? <laughs> All I want is a room somewhere Far away from the cold night air With one enormous chair I would dip lovely But despite all the problems plaguing the production, My Fair Lady became a screen triumph receiving a staggering 12 Oscar nominations. Audrey was not even nominated pretty much as a deliberate snub uh, to punish her, if not for the fact that she got the role and took it away from Julie Andrews, definitely for the fact that she didn't sing it. <laughs> 
The annual Academy Awards and the bestowing of the coveted Oscars has a glittering audience on hand to hear Audrey Hepburn announce the best actor. Rex Harrison! Rex Harrison, of course, receives his statuette for his role of Professor Higgins in My Fair Lady, chosen as the best picture of the year. Audrey was his leading lady. Deep love to, uh... Well, two fair ladies, I think. <laughs> yes, but only... Ironically, it was Julie Andrews who received the year's Best Actress Award for her screen debut in Mary Poppins. But though My Fair Lady had offered Audrey some of the sharpest criticism of her career, she remained as poised and dignified as ever. Her popularity, as always, was unharmed. Unfortunately, the same could not be said of her marriage. In her childhood, what now common flower did Audrey Hepburn need to eat in order to stay alive? Visit Biography.com for the answer. Pressured by the demands of a two-career family, Audrey Hepburn and Mel Ferrer once again left Hollywood, retreating to their remote home in Switzerland. Named La Paisible, or the Peaceful Place, the rustic retreat offered Audrey the privacy she craved and an opportunity to rebuild her troubled marriage. But in 1965, Audrey suffered yet another miscarriage and sank into yet another depression. Seeking a distraction, she went back to work, starring opposite Peter O'Toole in the charming comedy caper, How to Steal a Million. Her next role was even more impressive and more challenging. In director Stanley Donnan's marital comedy, Two for the Road. You love me? No, dear. Do you? Confessions exposing on the trough of Do you? Yes! Okay. <laughs> Co-starring Albert Finney and with a hauntingly lyrical score by Henry Mancini, the film told the story of a passionate young couple whose romance sours with marriage and the passing years. It was a part Audrey rarely played on screen, but knew only too well in real life. What sort of people sit in a restaurant and even try to talk to each other? Married people. In a last-ditch effort to save her crumbling marriage, Audrey once again collaborated with her husband, this time in the taut suspense thriller, Wait Until Dark. But although the film was a tremendous success, earning Audrey her fifth Academy Award nomination, the actress had to face the harsh realities of her 14-year marriage. On November 20th, 1968, the couple announced their divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. She was totally straight with me and she said, look, you know, we can't live together anymore. I think children know when things are not right. And so you're almost relieved when somebody comes out and says, hey, something ain't right. But the end of her marriage did not signal the end of Audrey's romantic life. Now nearly 40, she surprised everyone when she quickly fell in love with Dr. Andrea Dotti, an Italian psychiatrist. In a small, quiet ceremony, the couple married on January 18, 1969. Soon afterward, Audrey became pregnant, and after being bedridden for nearly six months, gave birth to a second son, Luca Dotti, on February 8, 1970. The role that Audrey Hepburn played best in life, in a lot of ways, was mother. She was, by all of the testimony of her two sons, the ideal mother. First I realized I had a mom, and she was a pretty great mom. And then I realized she was an actress, and she was involved with films. It was only much later that I realized that how much she was appreciated worldwide. And it's still a surprise, I must tell you. But uh, I have to appreciate that, because I think people love her for the right reasons, and I think she was deserving of that love. But as Audrey was caring for her son, rumors began to circulate that her husband was having affairs. Still, she remained committed to the marriage. In yet another effort to protect her family from the pressures of her career, she withdrew from public life for the next five years. But by 1975, at 46 years old, Audrey could no longer ignore the problems in her marriage. More and more, she and Dotti were leading separate lives. With her marriage disintegrating, Audrey contemplated going back to work after an eight-year absence. We all felt that it would be healthy for her to be in an environment where she was loved and taken care of. 
Co-starring Sean Connery, Robin and Marion told the tale of a middle-aged Robin Hood and his struggle to meet the challenge of advancing years. In her long-awaited return to the screen, Audrey Hepburn is married. No more scars, Robin. It's too much to lose it twice. I've never kissed a member of the clergy. Would it be a sin? The film proved to be a personal victory for Audrey, and its success re-established her as a viable screen star. Unfortunately, that fact did little to dull the pain of her failed marriage. With divorce imminent, she was becoming resigned to the fact that she might never find lasting companionship. Audrey and I met at the end of 1979, uh, at a time that was uh, really very difficult for, for both of us. My wife had died several months before. And Audrey was destroyed by a, a failed marriage, uh, very reluctant to, to cause Luca any pain. I think it was very frightening for Audrey, and, and, and she was content to just be uh, friends at first, which, which is all that I wanted at the time as well. Linked by their common sense of loss and their shared Dutch heritage, Audrey Hepburn and actor Robert Wolders fell in love. Some of our friends regarded us as antisocial. Days at home would be very, very leisurely. A stroll in the afternoon in the vineyards with the dogs, a swim if the weather allowed it, and then at night a friend or two, and that's what gave her the most pleasure. Surrounded by friends, family, and a new man in her life, Audrey had found contentment. But the star's long overdue happiness wouldn't signal the end of her good fortune. Just around the corner was the most important role of her career. But in 1989, after an absence of eight years, director Steven Spielberg convinced her to return to the screen in the sentimental fantasy, Always. I remember that Stephen was trying to figure out who could be God or the angel of heaven. Who could ever pull that off? He said, Audrey Hepburn. And everyone went, oh yeah, oh yeah. Come fear around the neck? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Listen. <laughs> How did I get out of that one? You didn't get out, Pete. I didn't. Mm -mm. Now I'm sitting here in the woods getting my hair cut. <laughs> well, either I'm dead or I'm, I'm crazy. You're not crazy, Pete. It wasn't just rolling out some old legend. It was an honor to be there and an honor to be in her presence. But despite a welcomed return, Audrey was no longer interested in a film career. By 1989, the role she truly coveted was Goodwill Ambassador for UNICEF, the United Nations Relief Organization for Children. She was touched by and deeply moved by the role UNICEF played in her own life. It wasn't just benevolent. There was a passion to it. It was something that she couldn't refuse uh, at first on a very limited basis. But then she was so drawn into the work when she realized the needs that it became almost an obsession. For the first time in her life, Audrey agreed to sacrifice her cherished privacy and used her celebrity to draw attention to UNICEF's efforts. She was a child of the war and of near starvation who'd been rescued by a UN organization. She not only remembered it, but she felt she had an obligation to give it back. Now 63 years old, Audrey went to Somalia on behalf of UNICEF, there to witness the massive devastation of civil war and famine. Audrey always chose to go where the conflict was the harshest. She didn't do it as Audrey Hepburn. She did it as a woman, as a mother, as somebody who saw the human family in jeopardy. Speaking before congressional committees and in numerous public service announcements, Audrey's heartfelt pleas on behalf of starving children helped raise the world's consciousness. I think it's safe to say that Audrey Hepburn is the person who 
made the world aware of Somalia. It wasn't something she enjoyed doing. She wanted to, though. She wanted to bring that message to the world, that how simple it was to help children. But as the selfless actress was engrossed with helping others, her own health began to fade. While in Somalia, she developed acute stomach pain and was later admitted to Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Known that she had contracted something, and she was ill from Somalia. That is to be expected. And we wished her well and knew that she'd get over it. What we didn't know is that it was cancer. The illness developed so suddenly and totally unexpectedly that, that it was very difficult for us to comprehend. And we were told that she had only three months to live which Sean, Luca and I, of course, absolutely resisted. We said it can't be. Life is much too precious to be taken away, just like that. We were very fortunate to live out the last few months of her life having the ability to say all the things you want to say at those times. And so when she passed on, as sad as it was, had all talked us into the fact that it was a normal and natural phase of life. And so we kept the good and left the sadness behind in a way to celebrate her life as well. On January 20th, 1993, Audrey Hepburn died at her home, surrounded by those she loved most, Robert, Sean, and Luca. A simple grave marked her final resting spot, not far from her beloved home. She was a living embodiment of the best in the human heart, the human mind, and soul. And I think people drew sustenance from that. I think that there are a few people in, in one's life that you never really feel that they're gone. I have to remind myself that she isn't around. She was the best that we could possibly be. She was perfectly charming and perfectly loving. She was a dream. And she was the dream that you remember when you wake up smiling. <laughs> what a lovely heritage she's left in this world. The films people can see and the joy that she gives them. And I can think of no more beautiful model to try to be like for the young people today, because there are not many like her that one would want to emulate. Isn't that true? The best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside. Somewhere they can be quiet, alone with the heavens, nature, and God. As long as this exists, and it certainly always will, I know there will always be comfort for every sorrow. And I firmly believe that nature brings solace in all troubles. When Audrey Hepburn won Broadway's coveted Tony Award in 1954, she said she wanted to thank all the people who nurtured a totally insecure, inexperienced, and skinny broad. But Audrey Hepburn was never viewed that way by her countless fans. When she died, columnist Rex Reed summed up the feelings of many by saying, Audrey Hepburn was proof that God could still create perfection. For more on Audrey Hepburn's family tree, log on to genealogy.com.